Hi everyone, I'm Steve. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. I've had a wonderful time. Uh, this conference has been amazing. Some people say that Miniswan is dead, but uh, not from this conference, definitely. Everyone has been wonderful. Um, if you would like to see my slides, they're online, so you can go to steveklabnick.github.io slash browsers eat the world if you want to look at it on your computer. But this looks like this is working pretty well. Um, <coughs> I use Linux instead of a Mac, and so occasionally I have problems with my projector, so I only use HTML and CSS for my slides, which will be relevant as I talk about uh, this, this topic. So, um, okay, here's the summary of my talk. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is that I think that we have failed non-programmers. I want to talk to you about how we have done that and what we can do to fix it. Um, this seems like a non-sequitur, but I swear it'll make more sense in a minute. Uh, then I want to talk to you about the way that web standards work today and why web standards have failed us as web developers um, because they're not useful. Um, and then where web standards are going tomorrow and why that is fixing this problem that we, we have and talking about how we're going to be extending web browsers in the future um, and then what that means for Rails and all the development that we do afterwards. So we have failed non-programmers. Um, I was with uh, Tom Dale uh, at GoGuruko in San Francisco and he said this sentence to me and I said, okay, Tom, sure. And then I sort of like forgot about it and changed the subject, but it stuck in the back of my head and the more that I thought about it, the more interesting it was and the more I came to realize he was totally right. So Tom told me, the thing I think historians will miss is that a web browser represents the first time we can download arbitrary executable code and not worry about screwing things up. So if I told you, click this link and download an EXE and run it, you would tell me no, I hope, right? Um, and that's because it could harm your computer. But that's what you do. Like JavaScript is a Turing complete programming language. So when you visit a web page, I mean, this presentation is in JavaScript, right? So um, I am effectively running an arbitrary program. Now, I wrote this one. But if you were looking at my slides, you'd be using one I wrote. And hopefully, you'd trust me not to screw up your computer. But uh, you know. Um, and so this is a really interesting property. And this is one of the reasons why the web has sort of gone from a collection of documents to being a application development and deployment platform, which is like two totally separate things. So I thought about this for a while and um, I let it go in the back of my head. Now, about a year ago, I got an iPad. This is like a random screen of an iPad. That's not important. Um, but I got this iPad because I like to play games on iOS and there was a music game on my phone called ReRave where you like hit buttons in time to the music and it's way easier on an iPad than on a phone, right? Because the screen is a lot bigger. So I like bought an iPad basically to play this game and some other games. Uh, and then I realized like, you know, if I spent all this money on this thing, I probably should use it for other things too, right? So I started using it for my everyday tasks. You know, I heard, oh, reading the web on an iPad is nice. So I started reading, you know, my things on it. And oh yeah, reading like technical papers and documents and PDFs is really nice. And so then eventually I came to realize that I hadn't used my actual computer in like a week. I had used my iPad for almost everything that was not programming. and. After thinking about it for a while, I realized that I definitely preferred to use an iPad to a regular computer for anything that was not coding. And when I thought about why, I realized that's because iOS disposes of all of the programmer legacy stuff that we make normal people deal with. So like file systems, right? That's not a thing outside of us. Like no one cares except for the people that are in this room. But we force normal people to deal with file systems because we're terrible, basically. Um, and so iOS gets rid of the notion of a file system. You know, you have a camera roll, every application has its own little chunk of disk, but you never have to think about those details. You just actually do work instead of fighting with the computer. Um, you know, we as programmers love to fight with the computer, but other people don't. Um, this is Firefox. Uh, if you'll notice, this is a Windows Firefox. Um, I just grabbed a random screenshot. I don't know. This might actually be in port. It's in, maybe it's Spanish. Um, this is the best like screenshot I could get of Firefox at the time. But uh, 
A couple years ago, so my family has always been an Apple family, and I hear that Macs are really expensive down here. Uh, you know, they're pretty expensive back home too, but nothing like they are here. But my uncle was a programmer, and so he would buy a new computer, he'd give it to my grandparents, then they would give it to my parents, and then they'd give it to me. So we always had like a long, you know, history of computers, and so um, Macs are expensive. So after a couple years, my family asked me like, hey, Steve, we want to buy a new computer, but we don't have a couple thousand dollars. We only have $500 to buy a computer. Are there any Macs that are $500? And I kind of laughed and then uh, thought about it. And I realized that uh, everything that my family did on the computer was entirely inside of a web browser. Their email, their viewing things, you know, everything, all was in a web browser. So I said, you know what? I'm going to build you a computer. It's not going to be a Mac. It's going to look a little bit different than you might be expecting, but just roll with it. And they said, OK. So I built them an Ubuntu machine, and I put Firefox on it. And you know they already used Firefox every day, and it was perfectly good for them. They were, had no problem switching from Apple to Linux um, because of the fact that the browser was already a universal application platform for them. Now, before web browsers, we had this. <laughs> so this is Microsoft Word 5.1. I don't know if any of you use this. I started using computers at a very young age because my uncle was a programmer and like gave me a book when I was very young. Um, but this was Word 5.1. And my mom used to use this for her job. She's like a, an office assistant. And so she would use this all the time. And you know, being the good little programmer that I am, when I heard that there was Word 6.0.1 out, I like demanded that we upgrade. And this is the screenshot of the splash screen for uh, Microsoft Word 601 in 1995 down there in the copyright screen, right? So I was like, Mom, we really need to get the new version of Word. Like, it's got all these new features. It's so cool. And the problem is, is that if you remember this time in Word's history, Word 6 looked like this. Uh, <laughs> And you know, as a good little programmer kid, I was like, man, look at all these features. I can embed Excel spreadsheets. I can do this. Isn't this awesome? Two days later, my mom made me uninstall it and put the old word back on instead. <laughs> and I, uh, you know, uh, I didn't exactly get along with my mom very well as a kid. Uh, we fought a lot. But I like to say that this is the only argument that I think that my mom was actually right. This is the one <laughs> argument that I lost. And, most people would frame this in terms of like a non-programmer person does not know how to do things on computers, right? Like normal people are stupid. They don't know the value of this. But I think that's totally wrong. Um, my mom is not stupid. She just has a low tolerance for bullshit. And this is basically 100% bullshit. Um, <laughs> The problem is, is that this is the way that we as programmers like to build software. You know, we just heard a talk about software minimalism, and while I do believe you should use Rails, um, <laughs> you know, we end up having these huge, you know, large amounts of features, uh, and I'm sure that there are some people that find every single little bit of these features useful, but not all of them at once, right? Um, and so this is the way that I think about operating systems now, is that we have all of these features that don't really matter in terms of getting stuff actually done. Um, and so, yeah, so Firefox, I would love to see the web and Firefox replace our operating systems entirely, actually. Um, and I'm not the only one who's talking about this. Uh, I actually use a Chromebook Pixel for most of my development now, um, although I have my, my Lenovo here, but uh, that is just Chrome as an operating system, right? And um, there's a really great talk by Gary Bernhardt that just finally came out on video that you should go watch later called The Birth and Death of JavaScript. And he also talks about this concept. We sort of independently came to the same idea. But the problem with iOS is that while it's great, uh, Apple is basically fascist. So uh, you know, I would love to see the open web replace the closed source you know, big evil Apple and have a free and open platform that we all can use to distribute applications. Um, and you know, there's things that we can do to sort of make the web a better application platform. Uh, and so I want to talk about some of the things that are getting in the way of doing that. Um, so let's talk about web standards. Uh, is anyone in the room involved in web standards at all? Cool. Does anybody know how web standards work? Awesome, a couple people. You guys are going to be bored for a second, I'm sorry. But everybody else needs to learn this. So, uh, the way that web standards works today is something like this. This is how it works. Um, 
a browser vendor that's like Google or, or Mozilla or Apple, they propose a new feature. They like build out what they expect. Um, then they uh, submit that feature to the W3C. Um, other browser vendors also implement that feature. They put you know, flags in front of it so that we know, you know which one we're going to be using. And then um, they argue about it on the, web, on the email lists forever until there's a consensus. And then we remove the feature flags off the beginning. Uh, and then we get it as actual web developers and we write a JavaScript shim over top of it because it's terrible. Right? <laughs> so, um, so this is like, we get new features, right? So I like to use CSS border radius as one of the examples, right? So we love the fact that we had like round corners and everything, but it took years. And by the time we actually got a standard for round corners, now everything's flat design and square corners. So like that's just <laughs> totally useless, right? Um, now, so the problems with this is that web vendors don't actually build websites. The C++ hackers who work on Firefox don't build web pages. I mean, maybe they do a little bit, right? But they primarily care about C++. Um, this process takes forever. Um, consensus is great, but it's very long. Um, there is no feedback from web developers anywhere in this process, as we saw from the fact that no one raised their hands during this, you know, do you get involved in web standards uh, discussion. And then finally, there's also spotty support, right? So if you've ever looked at like any of the comparisons of which browser supports which feature, uh, you want to cry yourself to sleep at night. Um, I have a friend who actually is an operating systems developer because he thinks that operating systems are easier to program than websites. And he's like, I don't want to deal with this, what, uh, Ruby and JavaScript and HTML and CSS and templating languages and databases. Like, he's like, I'll stick to writing schedulers. That's fine. Um, so the thing is, though, that as the web becomes more and more important, we sort of have recognized that this is a problem and that this is not working and that it's not very good. Um, and the problem with this is if we don't fix the standards process, we're going to return back to where we had Microsoft trying to destroy the entire internet with everyone having their own proprietary solutions and no you know, consensus whatsoever and no openness. So I don't want to eliminate the standards process, I want to fix it. Um, so there are some people talking about how to fix it and luckily all the major players are on board and so I want to share with you the way that web standards will hopefully work in the future. So, this is a little hand wavy at the moment. I'll explain more in a minute. Um, so, build new features in your browser in JavaScript first. So that is like all of you would build a new feature. Um, you would implement border radius in JavaScript. Uh, then, after you get something you're happy with, we could collectively submit it to the W3C for specification. And then after it's specified and we all have consensus about how the feature should work, then the browser vendors could implement it natively in C++ for speed. So this inverts the process entirely, right? So it starts with web developers and it ends with the low level stuff, not starting with the low level stuff and ending with web developers. The pros of this is we as web developers do build websites. Um, the speed of the process is not limited by the vendors actually implementing it, right? So how, mu how many hacks did all of us do to make rounded corners happen because we were waiting for border radius to be standardized, right? It was ridiculous. The other cool thing is that you get a polyfill on day one. So we don't have to worry about browsers that don't support this feature because you already have an implementation in JavaScript that you can fall back to if they don't have the native support built in yet. Um, so all this stuff is pretty cool. Um, the bad part is that I said that hand wavy bit before, right? You can't actually build new features in your browser in JavaScript yet. <laughs> um, so extending web browsers, this is where it sort of gets awesome and weird and ridiculous. Um, this is a little small, so there's a, there's a header called the content security policy header. It basically specifies where you are allowed to run JavaScript from. And the idea is this helps you prevent um, with security stuff um, from like cross-site scripting attacks. So someone injects their JavaScript on your page and you accidentally run it because we just run whatever JavaScript because the web is kind of ridiculous. Um, and so this says, this line's a little small on the monitor, but it says content security policy, default source, self, and ajax.googleapis.com. So we'll only run JavaScript from the, its own domain and from Google's CDN. Um, so if someone managed to exploit a cross-site scripting attack into a web page that was serving this header, the browser would refuse to execute the JavaScript that was injected. Um, so if we had a web browser that was extendable in JavaScript, 
we could actually prototype the content security policy header in the browser itself. So this is a theoretical JavaScript implementation of this idea, basically just like grabbing the origin from the window, then adding an event listener that like when you go to fetch some JavaScript, um, check to see if, you know, whatever policy you want. So in this case, we say if the origin is not equal to our own origin, then we block the network request. Otherwise, we let it go through. So with this sort of like arbitrary callback, we could prototype the way that this feature works beforehand and then standardize the effect later. Um, and the first version of content security policy has some problems, and so they're looking at like a content security policy version two, and they're talking about making it be this way instead of the previous way. So this, this is why I use content security policy as the example, is because this might be the first standard that is built using this process. Um, and so what's funny, when you start thinking about the idea of browsers extending things in JavaScript, you, I, I sort of realized that jQuery was sort of the original version of this idea, right? So selector engines were terrible. Um, so John Resig built us better ones in JavaScript. And so in this sort of weird future, um, jQuery would go to the W3C, they would standardize the new selector engine of jQuery, and then they would implement jQuery natively in C++, and it would be super fast. And then, if your browser was not, you know, jQuery enabled, you would just fetch the old JavaScript and you'd run it. And so now we have that support across every web browser, but in some of them it's fast and native as opposed to being slow. Um, there's another part of this too, right? So um, iOS has this notion of apps. And we use web apps too, right? So there's a little bit of a linguistic similarity there. And in some ways, bookmarking a website is kind of like installing an app if you squint, right? So when you put something on your homepage on you know, iOS, you get that little icon. And that's very similar to the, what, what's usually like um, the last nine websites you visited, right? If you could pre-download all of the assets um, that you would need for a particular web app, um, and if we were a little bit better about building web apps that worked offline, which is a whole other thing that people are really working on, then you could sort of install the client side part of a website into your browser. And you'd be able to instantly load it because you'd already have everything downloaded um, and all that other stuff. So this is another thing that both Google and um, Mozilla are both working on right now. Um, you know, the Chrome Web Store implements one version of this idea, right? You install these Chrome extensions, but they're all just written in HTML and CSS and JavaScript. Um, so, uh, before I talk about that, I have a couple of minutes still, so I want to also add on a little bit of the extra, the extra ridiculous. Um, so, ASM.js, is anybody familiar with that, or ASM? Um, so, ASM is a subset of JavaScript that can compile directly to assembly language. Um, and so, anything written in ASM.js will run on any web browser, but if you run it on a browser that has the ASM extension installed, it runs super fast. Um, and you can like turn OpenGL calls into WebGL calls and do all this other things. Um, they actually managed to port the Unreal Engine, some of the like latest 3D graphics um, stuff, to the web browser in a couple days using ASM.js. And so you can run the latest Unreal in your browser at like two thirds of the speed of your native, like if you ran it as an EXE, um, which is ridiculous. Um, it's like a full first person shooter 3D video game in JavaScript, sort of. In C++ compiled to JavaScript, which is then interpreted by V8, and then, you know, jitted into assembly language or whatever, um, which is kind of ridiculous and nuts. But I can like imagine this future where you visit unrealtournament.com, you, uh, you know, click install, and now, bam, you have Unreal and it just runs in your browser and you don't need to worry about these things. Um, there, there is one commercial game whose name I totally forget where they are now doing this as well. It's like 3D graphics, full thing in your browser. Totally blanking on the name though, I should have put it in the slides. So that is also coming where we can get real full applications, not just like little teeny web apps. Um, when I used my Chromebook, I actually realized I needed to edit some images, and I went, oh crap, editing some images, there's no way you can do that in the browser yet. And I was like, oh, maybe. So I opened up the Chrome Web Store, and I searched for image editing, and there was a, f nah. so as a programmer who uses the command line every day, there was a full Photoshop replacement in the Chrome Web Store, because I don't know how to use Photoshop, right? So uh, 
But for the purposes of editing my little image, it completely worked. I uh, loaded up this little app. Uh, it's, you know, clicked upload a file, it put it in my browser, I edited some stuff, I clicked save and it was back on my hard drive. Um, it's really, really impressive. Um, so that's sort of where I would like to see us go eventually is everything in the browser. Um, so what does this leave us for Rails and as Rubyists, right? Because I've been talking about JavaScript the entire time, basically. I haven't really mentioned anything about Ruby. Um, I feel more optimistic about this than many people do. So there's lots of people who believe that, for example, Node is going to rule over everything because then everything is in JavaScript. I think that's pretty ridiculous. Um, but in this kind of universe where we have all of our apps running client side in a browser, Rails is basically APIs only. And you know, I love APIs, so that's not like a bad thing. Um, but that's sort of the place that Rails has in the future. And luckily, Rails is fantastic for building APIs in um, because we have the Rails API project, um, which if you build APIs, you should check out and use, um, that sort of slims down Rails to remove the view stuff for HTML generation and only gives you the stuff that you need to serve up an API. Um, and so that's sort of where I see Rails fitting into the future is supporting the back end of these applications that run in your browser. Uh, Yehuda and I have, um, co-authored this JSON API spec at jsonapi.org. And so it's trying to create a standard way for us to build APIs um, very similarly uh, using the same kind of JSON. So for example, the great thing about Rails is conventions. That's why you're able to get so much stuff done so quickly, right? Because you know your user model is going to be an app models user.rb, right? You don't even need to think about it. It's just there. Um, and that's also, you know, Ruby in general is like that, like that, right? If you make a gem, you know that it's going to be in lib my gem name .rb, and that's probably going to load lib my gem name some other file .rb, and you know, we, we use conventions all the time. So JSON API is attempting to bring those conventions to our API design. Um, number four is the one that's like pretty controversial in many places in the Rails world, but I really think that if I was starting a new Rails app today, it would be a Rails and Ember app. Um, and that's because Ember ports the Rails philosophy to the JavaScript client side world. Um, Ember also embraces conventions. You know, Yehuda helped build Rails 3 and now he has built Ember. Um, it also has good support for this JSON API format because, you know, we built both sides of it, right? So we made it all work really well together. Um, but the other thing about building these JavaScript apps like Ember is that Ember is going to be poised to take advantage of these new web standards changing in the future. So if you've heard anything about the new web component spec that allows you to build reusable widgets to use in your web pages, Ember's components feature is tracking the progress of that feature in the background. So if you use Ember, you'll be able to natively take advantage of that feature whenever it becomes available to everyone else. You're sort of already setting yourself up in that way. And um, the Ember team really cares about embracing standards and doing what's, you know, what everyone else is doing going forward with regards to standards. So I really see Ember as being not only conceptually similar to Rails and therefore feels more at home than other JavaScript frameworks, but it's also sort of positioned to take advantage of this future where everything runs in your browser. Um, the last one is admit reality. Uh, and this is sort of a little sharply worded kind of variant on this. There, there is a certain set of people in the Rails world who want to ignore JavaScript. And like, trust me, I want to ignore JavaScript, but I'm an adult. I don't get to do what I want all day. I have to do what I have to do, right? So I eat my vegetables, I you know, go to work in the morning, and I write JavaScript sometimes, <laughs> uh, even though I don't like it. And so I think that if we continue to ignore the fact that people will use JavaScript to write applications, Rails is going to fall further and further behind and frankly look kind of stupid um, in the future because the rest of the world is saying, we're building websites in JavaScript and Rails is kind of saying, we're not. And that's like cool and all. You know, I mean, I, like I have tattoos. I'm not opposed to individualism, but um, I think it will make us look stupid. I don't want to look stupid. Um, so as much as I don't like it, JavaScript is here and here to stay, unfortunately. So <laughs> with that all said, um, <laughs> that is what I have for you today. Uh, there is, so when I talked about like Google and Apple and Microsoft signing on to this kind of feature, um, 
the extensible web manifesto is the name for this movement evolving web standards forward. So you can check it out at extensiblewebmanifesto.org. But this is where all of the people are talking about how this is changing, um, working on new stuff. The W3C technical architecture group has been doing a lot of really great work to help um, make this kind of thing happen and to advise the other uh, standards bodies about how to sort of take advantage of this in the future. So um, if you like this idea, you should definitely check it out. If you don't like this idea, you should also check it out. Um, but this is like where I see uh, everyone that I know is smart says this is where the future is going. So I trust them to you know, be giving me the right information. So, and it seems really great. So um, that's what I have to say about that. Um, the last thing before we go to questions, and we'll see if I, we'll see if I can actually get through this, um, is Jim. So uh, you know, the only reason that I'm here is because Jim is not. And there's not really anything that I can say uh, about what Jim meant to us. Um, Jim was one of the first people in Ruby World that I knew, and he was one of the best people that I ever had the pleasure of knowing. So, um, yeah, I can't possibly do him justice, so that's all I'll say is, you know, go check out some of Jim's stuff. Try to remember, you know, do things in the spirit of what Jim did. Be awesome to people, be kind and helpful, and, uh, you know, I'm not religious, but Jim was, and if there's anyone that deserves to go to heaven, it would be Jim. So, thanks. <laughs> the, uh, the last thing I'll say before I start crying is that the, uh, the, the worst part of it for me was that um, the last time I spoke to Jim, I said, oh, hey, Jim, how's it going? I see you're busy. I'll talk to you later. And then there wasn't a later. So um, make sure to talk to the people you care about, because you don't know when they're going to go away. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions about anything at all, because I think I'm early on time. Wow, I'm really early on time. Cool. I talk really fast. I apologize. Um, so, if any, yeah, if anybody has any questions about this stuff, anything else, uh, let's hear them. Uh, oh, hey. I think I need to translate. How can I do it? He will be able to Oh. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Oh. Okay. É, sobre a extensão de browsers, é, isso não seria uma ameaça à segurança, não? Por exemplo, a pessoa está implementando alguma funcionalidade que acabe é, sendo facilitando o, a invasão ou qualquer coisa parecida? Sure, the security of browser extensions? Yeah, so, okay, I think I may have got that. The, the security angle, so the question is basically, uh, in my understanding, what is the security angle of these browser extensions, right? And like, what is the problems around security? Is that, is that right? Yeah. Okay, so it's true that um, there is security issues around doing this, right? We are um, installing arbitrary programs. The thing about it is that currently, um, the JavaScript VM does not execute any code at all, right? There are safeguards in place. So if I visit a website on my phone, for example, I know that the website is not going to download all my contacts and email them all spam, right? So as we develop these extensions, we need to think really hard about how to prevent people from doing those bad things. And so um, as it was said earlier, right, uh, I'm not a security expert. There are other people who are. But because I have users, I have to care about security. So I'm hoping that the answer to this problem is, is that the standards will be written in such a way that it will be impossible to write bad code because the, uh, given you know, a bug in the interpreter or whatever, but um, in the same way that today I can wor not worry about them spamming me, um, it'd be impossible through a browser extension as well. But we definitely have a lot of work to do in that area, absolutely. Yeah.
Uh, just a quick question on about the ASM. Sure. Uh, because uh, it, in, actually it's like trying to be in favor of you that don't like JavaScript. Yeah. You, you think that in future when ASM gets more popular, we have like Ruby compilers through ASM so you can run your Ruby code on both yeah. sides and that kind of stuff? So the talk that I referenced, uh, Gary Bernhardt, yeah, I, I like, watched yeah. That. I so watched that. uh, that's sort of, I basically agree with Gary. So what Gary um, suggests in his talk is that if ASMJS takes off, then JavaScript will both be ubiquitous and no one will use it. Because no one will use JavaScript directly, they will compile programming languages that we like to program in to JavaScript, and then it will be run. So in the same way that we don't really ever code an assembly language every day, we won't code in JavaScript, but ultimately our, Java, our Ruby gets turned into assembly language, right? So I, I'm, I'm on board with that, and that's why I see ASM as a way for us to not abandon all of the existing JavaScript code while eventually getting reasonable languages in the, the browser. Because if we throw away everything that exists right now, um, you know, that's bad, right? We've all invested tons of time into building JavaScript apps, so the future is ASM and compile Ruby to ASM or compile whatever to ASM, definitely. Hi, Steve. Hey. Uh, uh, so I kind of have, <laughs> maybe I should stand up. Uh, uh, kind of two questions, and they, they sound like I'm trying to start a flame war, but I'm not. I'm actually just curious sure. about your opinion. Uh, so the first is um, just like, uh, have you, you played around with Angular at all and your, your thoughts on Angular sure. versus Ember? So um, I have played with Angular a little bit. Um, I know some of the Angular people. I think that they're great and they're doing good work. But I think that they are misguided. Um, and the reason is that their Angular is like a build your own framework kit. So it allows you to build the framework that you want to use in your application. But that means that you get a different framework every time, which destroys the convention ability of something like Ember. Um, and there's some other like smaller detailed choices that um, I currently don't like Angular for that I think will get better with ECMAScript 6. So for example, um, the dirty caching, the way that it works in Angular is that you use plain JavaScript objects and then it runs through a loop to check what things have been dirty and to like update them on the screen. That means that you have a limit, to, like a maximum limit to the number that you can have because it just gets too slow. I wanted to know your thoughts on Firefox OS. In Firefox yeah. OS, to install application, it does something like you mentioned. It, right. You are, the applications are actually HTML, CSS, and you know, JavaScript, and that's how you install them. You just download the assets. Right. So uh, how do you, like, what do you think about Firefox OS? I think that it's awesome. I have not been able to get a Firefox OS machine yet. Um, I don't even know if they, s they sell them in the States at all. Because um, I know Firefox OS is targeting like really low-end devices and you know like not 
rich people, <laughs> basically. Uh, and so I, I am always on Team Mozilla, almost always. Uh, and so I think Firefox OS is great, but I'm excited to see what the conflict of the two will bring about. Um, I think that once you have a browser as the operating system, running all of Linux to run one program doesn't make a lot of sense. And so I'm interested to see once we like bootstrap the process, how we can improve the underlying actual like operating stuff that's between the browser and the hardware to make it even better too. So um, and there's a lot of interesting research in that area and that kind of thing. But yeah, Firefox OS is also great, um, or at least what I've seen of it so far. Cool, thanks. Totally. Yeah, hi Steve, thanks, hey. great talk. Thanks. Quick question, um, so the new process of web standardization yes. sounds much better than the old one. Yes. Do you see any potential for uh, companies like Apple, Google still torpedoing this whole thing? Well, so most of them have already signed on to this, so um, I think I think Apple is maybe the holdout, but Google and Mozilla are on board with this, and the people that do their web standards work are on board with this. So um, I don't think, you know, we'll see how other various companies play out, but at least it seems that enough of the big players are like in charge of doing this that, that I hope that that will not happen. Um, you know, who knows, right? But cross your fingers. Thanks. I have, I have one more, since, sure. you since you're talking about their dirty checking in Angular. Yeah. yeah. Because, uh, and actually, that's something about Google and uh, current web standards that you, it looks like they are a lot together. For example, Google is planning to have the uh, object observable to solve the dirty checking problem. There is like, it's going to work the same way, but since it's going to be handled by the browser, it's like stupidly fast. Yeah. And what I see today is like, it seems like a lot of web standards like, are focused to target what uh, Google think is the future of the web. Mm -hmm. And I use it to be an Angular user a lot. And I used to love it, but recently I actually started liking React more. Yeah. And uh, it sometimes concerns about me when you're like, there's a lot of people interested in these JavaScript features, yeah. but they seem kind of target for a, a one way of thinking. Right. And uh, what if they are wrong? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally. So you get a lot of this stuff on the browser that you can't take it off because people depend on, Absolutely. on it. Absolutely. And I see, how do you see like solving this conflict of ideas changing and uh, people just realizing, hey, this is not a good idea. What yeah. to do with these kind of features? So first of all, I think React is amazing. And I hope, I hope that React goes into Angular and Ember and like becomes the way that they build their frameworks so that it's even faster. Because I think React is a great way to build um, apps, or at least to deal with the problem of updating the DOM. Um, but unfortunately, uh, everything about what we do is about we made mistakes and now we have to cover it up, right? So this computer is running on an Intel chip that uses x86-64, which is a terrible, ex terrible hack on top of x86, which is in itself a terrible, terrible hack, uh, you know, on top of whatever, and just like keeps going down the stack, right? So um, in my darkest days, I sometimes wonder is like, is von Neumann architecture the wrong like path? Like, you know, do we need to get the, go that far back to actually fix computers? Because, um, you know, most of the time computers just don't work uh, because we make all these mistakes, right? So I think, I think that part of, so I spent the last couple of years of my life teaching new people how to program, and the first thing that I tell them is, uh, the funny thing about programming is that if the computer worked and it did all the things you wanted it to do, you wouldn't be programming anymore. So in many ways, our entire discipline is about perpetually being frustrated and having things not working. And so you kind of have to be okay with that to be a programmer, like that's a prerequisite, right? Uh, I think about like, Medicine can't do TDD because people would die, right? Um, but 
most of the time you're programming, your tests are failing, right? So you're like, oh, failing tests, failing tests, failing tests, failing tests. They pass, I'll commit. I start writing a new feature, now my tests are failing again, right? So my test suite is failing far more than it's passing. So I think that we will make those mistakes and we will have to live with ourselves for making those mistakes. And, you know, that's, that's life as a programmer. Um, so yeah, we definitely won't get it perfect. I'd be very much willing to bet that we will definitely make a lot of mistakes and we will hate ourselves in the future. I like to joke that I, I swear git blame just prints out the current username, right? Like every, every time I'm like, man, what idiot wrote this code? And I like git blame and it's like Steve Klavnik. I'm like, oh. So yeah, totally. Awesome, well let's go uh, party or whatever, right? <laughs> That's like the most California sentence I've ever said, or whatever. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>